Thank you and welcome to the Laurie Institute in Sydney. This is our first public and very happily in-person event here in our fair city for 2021. For those of you who don't know me, and I think I recognise almost all of you here today, I'm Alex Oliver, I'm the Director of Research at the Institute. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the first Australians on whose traditional lands we meet and pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Welcome to our distinguished guests, members of the Sydney Consular Corps, and our wonderful supporters circle members who've generally, generously supported us throughout a difficult 2020 and are back this year in our very socially distanced event hall at 31 Bly Street. It's great to see your familiar faces unmediated by Zoom or a WebEx screen, but also a big welcome to those of you in Australia and abroad who are unable to be here with us in person, but who are watching on YouTube or listening to our podcast. We're delighted to have you as part of our growing audience in these online and socially distanced time. Before introducing our panellists this evening, I want to say two brief things about the events. First is an admin uh, issue, and that's, as always, we will devote about 20 minutes at the end of the hour uh, together to questions from you, the audience. So I'll start with one or two of my own, but please start thinking about your questions because that's often the most interesting part of the evening. Secondly, we've been holding these year ahead events in Sydney and Melbourne for, for a few years now. We actually had our first one in Canberra this year, and they're among our most interesting and well patronised events. And the theme of the event is, of course, the year ahead, and it's always interesting to reflect about the opinions and thoughts we might have offered last year, and how correct a set of predictions our experts might have offered back in February 2020. Back then, the pandemic was beginning to spread its tentacles outside of Wuhan, and Australia had closed its borders to China. The Ruby Princess had not yet docked at the passenger terminal in Circular Quay. New South Wales and Victoria were emerging from a summer of smoke and fire devastation, and we were assessing the damage and thinking about the implications for climate and energy policy and our approach to environmental disasters. Few in Australia or even the world guessed back then at the severity of what the coronavirus was about to unleash on us around the globe. It is a quote variously attributed to the physicist Niels Bohr, the movie producer Sam Goldwyn, and baseball legend Yogi Berra. But the wisdom is the same. It's tough to make predictions, especially about the future. So with that important proviso, uh, let me introduce our panellists to give us their thoughts on what this year might deliver, with all the caveats that that entails. Roland Raja is our lead economist and director of our International Economics Program and a multi-year project on global economic futures. Roland, together with our two of our other economics and political economy experts, will be releasing a paper shortly on the economic trajectories of the major global powers, the US, China, EU and India, and how that will shape the balance of power in the world. Roland is a former ADB, uh, DFAT and Reserve Bank economist and the author of several important Lowy Institute studies on China's so-called debt trap diplomacy in the Pacific, Indonesia's economic trajectory and policy recommendations for assisting Indonesia in the Pacific through the economic crisis this year. Jonathan Pryke leads our Pacific Research Program since joining the Institute in 2015 from the Development Policy Centre at ANU. He is an economist and public policy expert and one of Australia's and indeed the world's leading experts on Pacific politics, political economy and development. He is the architect of the Pacific Aid Map um, together with research fellow Alex Dayon and it's become the global resource for development funding, uh, tracking development funding to the Pacific. He's given formal evidence this year at no less, or this last year, at no less than four parliamentary inquiries on the Pacific, including to the UK Parliament's inquiry into British foreign policy. Peter Tsai, uh, no, last but not least, is making his first public appearance back at the Lowe Institute after spending several years in the private sector as Group Chief Advisor on the Executive Leadership Team at Virgin Australia. Peter first joined the Institute in 2016 and authored the 2017 Lowe Institute Analysis Understanding China's Belt and Road Initiative, which has become one of the, most, the world's most consulted and popular pieces of research on the Belt and Road Initiative. Previously, he was a journalist at The Australian the Spectator, The Age and Sydney Morning Herald. He has also worked at the Australian Treasury on the Foreign Investment Review Board Secretariat. And we're really pleased to have Peter back here in Sydney at Bly Street working with us. 
Um, so, so I'm going to go to Roland um, with a hard question, and that is about um, the economy this year in the world. Um, not just the United States and China, but also developing economies. At the end of the Trump presidency, uh, the coronavirus is still peaking in many parts of the world. What has happened to the global economy and the biggest economies of the world since we last met? Yeah, thanks, Alex. And it's uh, great to be here for a live, live event after a long uh, hiatus. Uh, you know, on the global economy, I think, um, you know, obviously last year we went through a very steep recession, which we are now just in the process of climbing out of and we're very, in, very much in the early days uh, of the recovery process. But I would say in general, I think we are seeing some positive signs that the outlook might be more optimistic, I think, than even what we might have thought just say, you know, a few weeks to even a month ago or so. So to start with some of the big economies, I mean, the US economy, we know, you know, they were hit very hard by COVID. They didn't handle the health aspects of COVID-19 particularly well under Donald Trump. But at the same time, they rolled out pretty big fiscal and monetary stimulus in order to support the economy. So the economy didn't actually do that bad last year. I think it contracted only by 3.5% for 2020 overall. Actually, one of the not so bad performers on the economic level uh, last year. And now if we look forward, things are starting to look more optimistic. One, of course, the US is now getting under control of the virus, right? The vaccine rollout's going reasonably well, and that's a very important element to the recovery. But the other element is the Biden stimulus. Now, Biden is clearly going after a very big fiscal stimulus package. 10 to 13% of US GDP is, is in the works. That's very, very significant. Some you know, center-left economists like former Treasury Secretary uh, Larry Summers is even talking about the potential for the US economy to even overheat and start to experience too much inflation as a result of, as a result of the amount of uh, stimulus that uh, the Biden administration is looking uh, to push through the economy. I'm personally less worried about inflation. I mean, for a variety of reasons, a little bit of inflation would probably be a good thing in the current context. You know, interest rates going up a bit actually would probably be a healthy thing for US monetary policy and the overall macro policy mix. And one thing that we did learn from the, the Trump administration's time, albeit I would say inadvertently, is that running what they call a high pressure economy, like really juicing demand, <clears throat> is very important to getting wage growth going again, and particularly for disadvantaged groups and minorities and lower skilled, the lower skilled segments uh, of the labor market. Where I do think we'll see something though is that there's gonna be really big spillover benefits from this as well for the rest of the global economy through the trade channel in terms of US demand for the rest of the world's exports. A lot of that, of course, is gonna fall on Asia. Who's big in Asia? It's gonna be China and it's going to be at Vietnam. So they're going to be running even bigger trade surpluses with the United States this year, I would say. And that, of course, could be a source for, for future tension. Uh, quickly, in China's economy, obviously we know China was the source of the virus, but they have done quite well in terms of suppressing the virus. That's been the key. Rather than stimulus to their pretty good recovery, they actually were able to eke out positive economic growth last year. And I think this year, again, they're going to continue to recover quite well, but they're also going to get this extra bump and support from actually the Biden stimulus through, through the trade channel. EU, EU didn't handle the pandemic too well on the health front, also didn't do as much fiscal stimulus support as say the United States did. So their economy did worse last year, probably gonna recover slower this year. Their vaccine rollout also not going as fast as the United States. But one I think very pos important positive element is what's happening for the developing world. And so last week we saw the G7 announce they're going to put another $7 billion at the, the, U, the WHO's, um, I think it's, it's the COVAX uh, initiative or the ACT Accelerator initiative, which COVAX is a part of, which is going to be providing the vaccines to the developing world. That's a big increase in funding. Uh, isn't, it's not enough. More needs to be done. There's issues around vaccine supply, timing, hoarding, these sorts of things. But I think it's a very positive sign that while unfortunately the developing world might be towards the back of the queue, they're not going to be left to be too far behind the rich world. And that's obviously important when it comes to you know, avoiding new mutant strains of the virus spreading, prolonging the pandemic and getting in the way of, of recovery. So I think that's a very positive step on that front as well. Which leads us to the Pacific, um, because obviously vaccine, uh, access to vaccines is going to be critical to the Pacific as well. Your patch of the world, Jono, has been generally very successful at keeping the pandemic at bay. Just give us a brief recap of how um, the various Pacific islands um, managed last year and, and what comes next for them. 
Thanks, Alex. And yeah, echoing uh, your sentiments, it's great to be here. It's very novel to be back here in the flesh. I mean, I've spent so much time on Zoom in the last year. I'm just waiting for my cat to walk along the stage <laughs> any minute now. Um, but in, in all seriousness, uh, the Pacific has done, it's historic, uh, the, how great a job the Pacific has done in combating uh, COVID-19 and the health impacts of COVID-19. These countries reacted very swiftly with foresight to close themselves off from the outside world. You know, they, 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 in, it's not too distant a memory for them just how devastated many of these countries were by the 1918 measles epidemic, uh, uh, sorry, Spanish flu epidemic. And more recently, measles has uh, affected countries like Samoa to um, devastating effect as well. So, you know, they, they acted swiftly. They cut themselves off from the outside world. And many of these countries remain the only countries in the world that are COVID, remain COVID free. But this hasn't come without a dramatic cost to these economies. We, uh, Roland has led some excellent work looking, trying to look at the economic impact that uh, is these measures have taken and will continue to take as we remain, as the borders remain shut. And it's pretty uh, devastating. You know, we're looking at a lost decade of development for the Pacific if more action is not taken very quickly to help stimulate these economies. So some, some numbers, you know, Fiji has experienced a 23% economic contraction last year. Uh, Vanuatu expects to lose 60% of its formal sector employment opportunities. Cook Islands, similar numbers. You know, these are numbers like that happening in Australia, we would see societal collapse. You know, so it's a testament to their traditional welfare systems, to uh, other, other parts of these societies that they are holding together through this. But I don't want to understate just how tough it has been to protect their communities from this devastating virus. Now, not, not all of them have done so well. Papua New Guinea uh, seems like we don't really have a good handle on what's going on up there. And there's going to be a lot of work to be done in the future to, to help curb COVID-19 in that country, which is already dealing with other really significant health issues. Uh, whilst COVID's been going on, the Pacific has not been sitting in stasis. There's been a lot of geopolitical interest. There's been a lot of Chinese activity. There's been a lot of internal regional issues that have been hashed out very publicly. So last year we had, at the end of last year, we had a big blow up in Papua New Guinea politics and the uh, Prime Minister Marape, who just recently ca came to power, he looked like he was going to lose it. And we had two months of political disarray as People were moving from camps and the opposition eventually had enough numbers. People moved back. No one could coalesce around an opposition leader. It all got very messy and we landed almost right back where we started with James Marape clinging on to power. But he's clearly made a lot of deals that has um, you know, left him diminished in that role as prime minister in a time where PNG does need some strong, stable leadership. So is, this the, this is, is this the sort of normal course of politics in PNG? Because, it, you know, we, we do have this, seem to have this pattern of sort of leadership changes after the first 12 to 18 months. Yeah, I mean... It, or was it, was it exacerbated by COVID? Yeah, look, it's no, I, I don't think COVID had a whole lot to do with it. It is part of the politi political structure of PNG. There was weak political parties. People jump from parties uh, very, very willingly. Uh, it's much more about systems of patronage, about identity, about regionalism. It uh, has far less to do with yet yeah, any political or ideological identity. So things move very fluidly there. And you know, we did have some, a period of stability through the Samare and O'Neill year, years because they were so, these were such effective leaders and in coalition builders. And, but it's a very challenging political environment. You know, you'd never, I would not wish being a PNG politician on my worst enemies because it is such a tough job that these guys have. Um, but anyway, that's, in, that's all in the, in the past. I mean, this year we've already hit, the Pacific has you know, hit with a bang. Um, and it's all about regionalism at the moment. We, so I'm trying to rush through this because there's a lot of context, but the Pacific Islands Forum is, is the region's lead, peak political and economic body uh, made up of 18 members of Pacific Island sovereign nations, the territories of New Caledonia and French Polynesia and Australia and New Zealand. This, has, this organization has been around for 50 years. It is very important for uh, pan-Pacific culture and identity purposes. It, it is, has a lot of symbolism to it, but it's also very uh, important uh, practically, because it's the forum in which all leaders can get together in the Pacific yearly to discuss really thorny issues and then reach consensus on these issues to then speak to these issues on a global stage. This is one of the main, the forum is one of the main reasons that the Pacific has spoke, so outspoken on climate change, fisheries, uh, in the past, nuclear non-proliferation, the list goes on. Uh, the, the head of this organization, the Secretary General, is a very coveted position in the Pacific. There's been this gentleman's agreement that it rotates around the subgroups of Polynesia, Melanesia, and Micronesia in the past. And the Micronesians were adamant that it's their turn. The Micronesians are often the smallest and less populous states that feel marginalized in these regional fora to begin with. There's a lot of historic animosity in the, in the forum. 
And uh, this kind of did blow over as a result of COVID because the Micronesians were adamant it was their turn. They put up a candidate, but because they couldn't all meet in the usual slate of meetings that uh, you would expect in 2019, no one, co no one else coalesced around that candidate. So we ended up with the secretary general race with five candidates from all subgroups uh, being backed by their governments. It was a real mess. And we ended up, and then to bring it all to a head in February this year, we had a leaders meeting on Zoom, the first time in 50 years of this organization, the leaders meeting has been done digitally. And well, it, we couldn't have had a worse outcome. You know, we, we ended this thing, this organization prides itself on consensus. And we had to, after a 16 hour marathon meeting at two in the morning, we went to a runoff vote down the line between Cook Islands, former prime minister, Henry Puna, and the Micronesian candidate, Gerald Zacchaeus from the Marshall Islands. Uh, we, we, it was a secret ballot, nine, eight vote. So, you know, the region has split right down the middle on this one. And, uh, and, you know, and Henry Puna, the Polynesian candidate got up. This has led to huge fallout in the Pacific. The Micronesians had already threatened that they were gonna walk if their candidate didn't get, didn't get in. And they've followed through on that threat. So five members of this 18 member group has decided we're out of here. And, uh, you know, this couldn't have happened a worse time for the region, you know, dealing with COVID, dealing with geopolitics, dealing with the econ economic recovery, dealing with climate change. The whole, this whole year is going to be about trying to save Pacific regionalism. And how do you do that when you can't meet in person? Mm. So that's going to be a defining issue for this year. And, um, you know, I, I think there's a way through it, but um, it's going to take a lot of work from all parties to to pull the region back together again. And I'm going to come back to you afterwards and talk about what this means for Australia and the way Australia deals with the Pacific is obviously very important for us too. Um, Peter, Australia has gone from the fridge to the freezer uh, in the space <clears throat> of uh, just a few short months, really. Um, we were in the fridge last year as a result of a couple of years of tensions, uh, foreign interference, and influence legislation, there were 5G decisions, there's been various um, Takeover, uh, takeover and foreign investment decisions on China, but it was probably the federal government's call for a, an investigation into the origins of the coronavirus that, that really froze us out. Um, China, our largest pr trading partner and now one of our most problematic relationships. What, what's your assessment of the state of China-Australia relations Important. and prospects? <laughs> yes. Try not to be too negative. Okay, sure. Um... Well, as Alex alluded to, last year I worked on two issues, aviation and China. I don't know which one was more traumatic for me. <laughs> um, and uh, so I think this year, I mean, last year was quite interesting because, you know, when I report a commodity price, people talk about there used to be a floor price. As last year, as we were watching and as I was watching the unfolding of the events, I thought, oh, that got to be the lowest point. But then, you know, next day the news, something else happened. So I'm just wondering, like, what is in store for us this year? I think, um, I mean, I've been told not to be too negative, but I just think if you think about there Go potentially um, some other flashpoint potentially come out this year, if you think about the parliament that passed the foreign relations bill, and one of the scenes that's firmly, I think, in the government's crosshairs, probably the Victorian government's Belgian Road Agreement, and remember, this is kind of a signature policy for the Chinese president. And if that one get cancelled, um, I, I doubt there will be a very positive reception of that news. And um, if you think about uh, there are potentially some, you know, foreign investment review board decision coming up. And you know, given the the kind of a track record so far of um, rejection, and that might not play down really well. And given the new Biden administration has the particular big focus on human rights issues like Xinjiang, um, Hong Kong, and et cetera. So if they are kind of further more formal compliance or even sanction potentially on Xinjiang and Hong Kong related issues, uh, you just say they're kind of a further room um, for, for things to get worth in a way. Um, I think so far, if you look at a trade relationship, the you know the, the kind of the the really boring iron ore price kind of cover up the trouble in a way because you know we're talking about a record high iron ore price a bit of a replay I think for two thousand eight and nine but I think on the other hand you you saw an acquired across spectrum trade sanction against a lot of Australian industry which is something you know I have never seen before I mean China um, does practice kind of economic 
use economic statecraft in a negative way, which is instead of a rewarding, um, I mean, it's a, you know, punishing people through punitive moves. It happened previously with South Korea, with the Philippines, but it's usually quite limited in the scope. But this is for the first time we have seen something that's across the spectrum. So, you know, like, I don't really kind of see a circuit breaker in a way because traditionally a change of a government offers a circuit breaker. But if you look at um, the, the China policy here, um, um, in Australia is largely bipartisan. So a lot of legislations on foreign interference, foreign relations bills passed with the ALP support. And, you know, often the ALP makes some criticism of the government policy, but not, not in a very stark way. So there's kind of a, across the party, across bipartisan support. So there's no immediate, I can't see any shots, you know, circuit breaker and there's actually just a lot of rooms for kind of a the or kind of escalation this year. So um, not not a particularly an upbeat assessment, but this is kind of the 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 sad geopolitical force we have to deal with. Mm. Um, that euphemism is right up there. Mm. China's economic statecraft. Mm. So thanks for that. <laughs> um, John, I'm going to come back to you now, um, not on the question of the Australia relationship, which we must get to, but that is China in the Pacific. And um, its presence in the Pacific, and you mentioned that it, there was a bit of sort of geopoliticking going on throughout the year, but its presence in the Pacific pre-COVID was very clear and obvious. Um, President Xi at the APEC and, and China's diplomacy there, uh, China's infrastructure projects in the region, its offers of development and even budget assistance. Um, it seems to have been strangely absent during the COVID period or at least to an external observer. So w w to what do you attribute that and has China uh, you know, backed off on the Pacific or is it just in abeyance? Yeah, so look, as you said, uh, in the lead up to COVID, China was really on the march in the, in the Pacific. You'd, you know, you didn't need to be a geopolitical analyst. You just needed to go to these countries and walk into any town and you'd see tradespeople everywhere, Biz, uh, business people in every capital, state and enterprises operating across the board, building infrastructure and delivering Chinese aid. and. Uh, and then at the political level, uh, politicians from all countries were getting flown in and getting the royal treatment in Beijing. There was a real, uh, seemed to be a concerted effort of engagement with, with uh, the Pacific on behalf of China. This wasn't, didn't go unnoticed. Australia and others really did respond. And I think earnestly, the Australian government's uh, response to not just China, China's engagement, but also just what I think perceived by the Morrison government to be a, a lack of attention on the region um, writ large beyond geopolitics led to a major step up of our own engagement. So, you know, it was a great time to be a geopolitical analyst on the Pacific. Uh, you know, job security was looking great, but, um, but you know, it was a real frenetic time for the, for the region. And uh, yeah, it culminated with Xi's visit to Papua New Guinea at APEC, and he spent like five days in the country. And it was anyone, all anyone could talk about afterwards was how great that Xi guy was. Um, and, you know, he really gave a lot of time to the region um, that they'd never really seen before of people of that stature in the world. So yeah, it was really seeming um, like that there was a real shift afoot and then COVID hit and it seems like China has really retreated into it unto itself. Um, they don't like hearing this, but um, you, know, you, you just have a look at the commitments that have come out from Australia, New Zealand, multilateral agencies, the World Health Organization, and you know, missing in all of that and in the substance and what and the extra support being given to this region is really doing it tough is China. You know, that they do talk about some PPE d diplomacy that mm. they've, they've done, some, some many meetings that they've had between the Ministry of Health and, lead and you know, ministers from around the Pacific. But it's all such tokenistic effort compared to the footprint they have in the Pacific today. You know, they need to take greater responsibility for this presence that they are trying to claim in the region. What about vaccine diplomacy? So, yeah, this is, I mean, that, does that mean Australia and others should be complacent if they want to, you know, build, continue to build their own influence in the region? I don't think so. I mean, we've heard all these news stories recently just in Papua New Guinea about Daru and setting up some major fisheries facility or some mega city. You know, just talk to anyone who's been to Daru. Tuberculosis is, you know, a no-go. It makes that whole region a no-go zone. It needs a huge amount of work and assistance before you can even get to talking about these sorts of things, China's, that, is, that are out there in the media. So there's definitely activity, um, and I think we'd be naive to think that China's not going to come back to the region once it, but now that it can refocus. And uh, the next battleground will be vaccines. So it's, you know, 
as, as Roland mentioned, the risk for the developing world is that they'll just be so far at the back of the line, it's going to take so long for them to get access. Australia has made commitments to finance the vaccine rollout in the Pacific. So has New Zealand. I mean, logistic challenge, logistical challenges aside, there are enough backers, the World Health Organization and China, that they will get access to vaccines. But who's going to get there first? You know, we've only just started doing our jabs here this week. Uh, and so, but then it raises all sorts of other questions, like because the economic recovery is going to be so uh, linked with a travel bubble being established with Australia and New Zealand. If any of these Pacific countries take the China vaccine, is that actually going to be uh, approved in Australia or even uh, recognised? So, you know, if Solomon Islands takes the China vaccine, are we ever going to let, are we ever going to establish a travel bubble with Solomon Islands? There's real, some really interesting questions uh, out there, but also these countries, you know, um, it, it really is down to a, a race. Who's going to get there first? And the, that's going to be the strongest consideration of, of all, I think. And so that has to be a consideration in the rollout in Australia of our own vaccine program mm -hmm. is not, you know, not doing us all first before we can start thinking about the Pacific if we want to you know, maintain our position in the region. Um, you talked about battleground, so I'm going to go to a big battleground, which is in your territory, Roland. Um, Non-resident fellow Bonnie Glazer from uh, CSIS in uh, the United States said in an early analysis series that we did on the impact of COVID internationally, said that the pandemic will accelerate the trend of reducing the interdependence of the US and Chinese economies. So decoupling. What, what, ha what happened in 2020 and what, what, what do you see happening with that uh, prediction of decoupling? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's very much a, a mixed picture. I mean, I think, you know, it's, it's easier to assess what's happened since Trump basically launched the trade war with China, which was, you know, broadly all about um, decoupling. You know, what we've seen, I think, is, you know, if you're talking about sort of wholesale decoupling of trade and investment flows, for example, then what we've seen is some decoupling a really very partial decoupling and, and quite mixed, a really quite quite a mixed picture. So for example, if you look at, 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 at trade flows, right? So trade between the United States and China has gone down in both, in both directions. But what, let's get some relativities here. China has gone from being 20% of US imports. Now it's, seven, it, then it became 17% of, of US imports. So that's a meaningful change. As an economist, you go, that, that's something. But if you're talking about decoupling, it's not really a big difference, right? And now since COVID, actually COVID reversed that. China's now back up to 19, 20% of US imports. Now there's a range of sort of temporary factors. You know, people are at home, they're gonna be buying electronics and stuff that enables work from home. And China happens to produce a lot of that stuff. For example, China also recovered, reopened quicker than others. So they're, they're the supplier on the other side when people need stuff. So there's some temporary factors there, but the point is pretty partial picture on the trade front. China, in the meantime, is trading more with other countries as well, right? It's, it's uh, exporting more to other countries other than the United States. And those other countries like the EU or ASEAN, Japan, they're exporting more to China when the US is exporting less, right? So the trade picture, pretty partial and mixed. Investment, well, Chinese investment into the United States basically collapsed as a result of the trade war, but US investment into China stayed pretty high. Now, it did collapse because of COVID, but I'd say that probably it's going to return, right? There's still that interest in terms of investing uh, within the, the Chinese market. And that's sort of FDI, foreign direct investment. If you look at portfolio, what we call portfolio investments, so financial investment in stocks and equities and bonds, that sort of thing, actually the flows into China are at record highs, right? And that's got to do with the fact that actually the US investors have a very high interest in what they would see as diversifying their portfolio into the Chinese market. On the other hand, China has actually only very gradually been opening up its market for that type of investment. So there's a lot of way to go on that front. So financial integration is actually going ahead full steam. So if you look at that trade, partial and probably ending, Biden, that, that required really high tariffs under the, from Trump. Biden's not gonna get rid of them necessarily very soon, but he's not gonna increase them. So that's basically played out. Investment flows into China are still gonna continue, flows from China to the United States basically stalled. And then financial flows, that's actually accelerating. So I'd actually say there's not a lot of decoupling actually going on. Of course, that's at the broad sort of wholesale level. If you look at technology, for example, it's a very different picture. You've got the sanctions on Huawei. You've got the semiconductor controls and all technology to do with semiconductors. And if you look at the investment flows as well, if you look within just the technology sector, it's completely zeroed out in both directions. So obviously the technology side of things, uh, rare earths, critical minerals, sensitive supply chains like PPE, 
Expect decoupling, decoupling there, but it's very selective, not broad based. Mm. Um, Peter, staying with China, um, what's happened to Belt and Road? Um, your paper five years ago now, is it? When at the time there were predictions of more than one trillion expenditure by China on Belt and Road, its plan, its grand plan to create these alternative economic structures, uh, its global influence, new standard setting in its favour, um, individual projects of 60 billion or more. Uh, what happened? What, what has happened to Belt and Road? It's not something that we've heard a lot about in the last year for obvious reasons. I think yeah, Belt and Road is probably arguably the kind of most significant signature policy for the Chinese president, but, um, you know, kind of unveiled um, many years ago, but has since run into a variety of issues. I think um, um, I, I remember the time when I was doing my report, I interviewed with people, there were some Chinese financiers and bankers explaining to me why they are kind of a bit of reluctant to invest in developing country, why they prefer to kind of invest in buildings in the CBDs with cities and in Toronto, it's a, for good reason. Um, it's um, to do with sovereign risk, to do with the, the ability of this country um, uh, to, to bear the cost of this massive infrastructure project. I think um, a, perhaps the, a, a really good case to illustrate is, is China-Pakistan economic corridor. It's probably one of its flagship projects um, for a long time. And, you know, China's, you know, Pakistan is one for China's very few allies in the world. And uh, so there's strong military political relationship, but the missing element is always the economic relationship. So at a time, China promised to invest something about $60 billion in, in Pakistan. This whole stream of infrastructure projects, Port Guada, and also a lot of energy projects and et cetera. So I think recently it runs into kind of a, um, a fair bit of a, a trouble in the sense because I think the total amount that being invested is around about, I think, $25 billion, just a little bit under the kind of allocated, you know, $60 billion. I think for a couple of reasons, you know, first one is uh, very much to the Pakistan's, you know, kind of economy. It's, um, it has a persistent issue with the balance of the payment, is kind of a fiscally unable to support and a large infrastructure investment on that scale. And also they're kind of a geopolitical forces in play as always, because um, I remember when I was kind of talking to the Indian colleagues about the kind of whole um, Pakistan project and the, their, their whole reception is, you know, as, you know, as long as Pakistan in and India is out. So that was like reaction five or six years ago. You can imagine now the reaction of the, the kind of Indian analysts and the commentators on, on the Belgian road project. So there's a kind of a confluence of a, kind of a economic inability, if you can describe that way, to support the, the um, infrastructure on that scale and also the kind of a geopolitical forces against it. Um, it. Since then, if you look at the Belgian Road, I think initially, I mean, even here at home, you can see the, the opinion of the Belgian Road hardened over the time. Initially, people were kind of a, a doubtful about its benefits that would deliver, but over the time, it's kind of hardened into a, a kind of resolute um, opposition to the project because it's largely seen as a, a geopolitical project to expand China's influence. So there's a kind of a whole host of factors kind of against um, um, Belgian Road, um, but it's kind of because it's scra you know, kind of a stretch you know, into so many geographical areas. In, part, in some parts of the world, it goes well, in the kind of in the Central Asia, investing road and in the energy po projects, but I think China runs into the issue like any other investors in a developing country. It basically runs into the, the ability of the host country to afford it. And also, I think China has a reputation as an infrastructure builder, um, you know, like bridges, you know, like, you know, airports and et cetera. But the problem is um, China finds out, um, like anyone else, you know, to replicate that success, you know, in a different country, in a different environment, dealing with kind of a tribal politics, dealing with labor issue in these countries, dealing with a skilled workforce. So it's actually quite hard to translate China's accumulated experience of infrastructure building in the different parts of the world. If they had a trouble in Western Australia building an iron ore mine, you can imagine the trouble they would have in Africa and in parts of the world building bridges and et cetera. So this is a quite, quite a huge challenge because all the 
kind of an administrative advantages and et cetera that China would enjoy at home. It's quite, quite hard to replicate abroad. So kind of in the short, um, the, you know, the Belt and Road kind of, a, you know, kind of losing a sting a little bit just basically by the, by the fact that uh, a lot of the countries along the Belt and Road have a kind of limited financial capacity to take on the projects that China is kind of thinking about. And, but, you know, like this is such, an, uh, you know, President Xi spent a lot of his personal political capital on this project. I think this would keep going, would keep going. Um, and, uh, but I think it would be, you know, the, the China is probably kind of marked by reality a bit about the difficulties and the financial restraint. So it has to scale back its ambition um, perhaps will not kind of admit it so openly, but it's also kind of a pandemic as well play into all that. Um, I'm going to go to you for questions very shortly and while I'm thinking about them, I'm going to ask um, the burning one, which is so refreshing not to have talked about Donald Trump incessantly through every event, which is I think what we've been uh, doing over the last few years. It's only actually been one month since the inauguration of President Biden, and um, and there you go. We've only mentioned his name once. Um, but what are the implications of U.S. policy for U.S. policy under Biden for Australia, for the Asia Pacific? Um, I'm going to ask you first, Roland. It was just days after President Biden signed the order to re-enter the 2015 Paris Agreement. John's, John Kerry said that the United States was proud to be back in the global climate discussion and that we've got to bring an unprecedented global finance plan to the table. So that sounds big. And in fact, I think uh, I think he actually used that word, we're going to do something big. Um, so what, what kind of um, climate policy of the United States, um, what will the United States have and what does that mean for Australia? Yeah, I mean, I think it's very clear that they want to bring a lot of ambition to climate policy, both domestically, but the key thing, particularly for Australia, is they want to put the pressure on other countries uh, to also do their bit as much as possible. Now, there's going to be an, obviously a diplomatic element to that, but there might also be some hard economic elements as well. One of the interesting things we can, we, we can talk about later, perhaps, if there was interest, is around these carbon tariffs. So the European Union, for example, is quite advanced in its thinking. They want to apply carbon tariffs um, because they're looking to do more ambitious climate mitigation at home and they're worried about carbon, carbon leakage via imports from, from countries that are not doing enough, right? Um, and the UK now is also thinking about that and Biden uh, in his pre-election campaign was also talking about doing something like that, although we haven't heard as much about it uh, since that time. So that'll be an important element, I think, of the agenda. Um, the other element, though, of course, is climate finance. And it's a bit unclear exactly what they're going to do. They're talking that they're going to do something really big, but they haven't really uh, revealed what the details of that will be exactly. For me, I think a, a few things to think about in, just in terms of climate finance, however. Of course, one is that the need is very, very big. Uh, you know, developing countries, that's what we're talking about, climate finance to developing countries. That, you know, they need the money if they're going to decarbonize. They can't do it on their own. And there's also a strong economic argument as well, because a lot of the times it's cheaper to mitigate and reduce emissions in some of these countries because they don't have all this infrastructure in place and it's often about new additional meeting new and additional energy needs and that sort of thing uh, for example i think one really important element is going to be whether or not it's going to be truly additional money so there's already an existing pledge from the rich world to provide 100 billion dollars a year in climate finance to the developing world now we're notionally according to the oecd at 80 billion dollars a year now uh, in climate finance the target is 100 for uh, in the next few years or sometime around now. So it was broadly there. Um, actually, it was 2020. It was a 2018 number. It was $80 billion. Um, but all that money has come from existing aid budgets. So none of it has actually been hmm. additional. Yeah. And when you think about it, that money is to not actually necessarily help that country, but actually to serve the purpose of global mitigation. Right? So it's not actually about helping that particular country reduce emissions for their own benefit. It's actually for the global benefit. So you're actually taking something away from these countries. So I think that's going to be a real test. Is there going to be additional money put on the table uh, for climate finance? And then thirdly, I think there's an opportunity here to, of course, link it to the recovery from COVID-19 in terms of having a green recovery. And we know that you know the most best way to deliver the kind of recovery stimulus that we want to see, invest in infrastructure, things that are productive, invest in things that are going to create a lot of jobs, there's a lot of opportunity there in terms of green infrastructure, and of course, 
greening the recovery is a good thing in and of itself. Let's come back to greening. Um, but just quickly, Jono, um, the US in the Pacific. So look, I actually think the Pacific did pretty well under the Trump administration. You know, in, in a time, that, what attention span the Trump administration had, there was some of it going to the Pacific. Uh, you know, that there was more aid. They committed to more Coast Guard patrols and plugging in and helping support fisheries um, management. Uh, they, they provided more diplomatic support and diplomatic profile in the region. And, you know, missions like even here in Canberra, one of their key priorities was to support the Morrison government step up in the Pacific. This is like unheard of for me. Uh, and so, yeah, clearly people in Washington were paying attention. Uh, and the biggest prize was in the North Pacific, where the US really has this hegemonic role in these three compact of association nations, Palau, Federated States, Micronesia, and Marshall Islands. They are entitled to all sorts of privileges like the United States Postal Service, visa-free access to the United States, they can all enlist in the US military, all these different benefits that do cost the US a lot of money to provide. And it's a lot of the legacy of nuclear testing, colonialism, all, you know, there's a reason for this, this compact relationship. But these were all set to expire in the next few years. Five years ago, when talking to US officials, they would say, why are we spending all this money in this part of the world? What a waste of money. You know, it's so expensive to have this relationship, which gives them, you know, strategic control over these massive seascapes. Uh, and now you, you talk to American officials and they say, man, what great value for money these investments are. <laughs> and that's not just thanks, to, that's you know, largely thanks to China, but I think equally thanks to the administration actually paying attention. Mm -hmm. So we're seeing a full reversal of the compact uh, renegotiations. You know, they're going to get the money that they, they expect and want, and this relationship can continue to the benefit of both parties. So, you know, at a minimum, I hope the Biden administration will do what the Trump administration was doing. And, you know, of course, on top of that, you have the reverse step on climate change that, you know, the Pacific are the canary in the coal mine for us here. They are at the front lines of fighting the adverse effects of climate change. And so that, of course, is going to um, the Biden uh, stance on climate change is going to make them a lot of friends in the, in the region. So, um, you know, it, it, I think we, we entered the administration on a good note and hopefully that, you know, the song will keep going. Now, I'm pretty sure one of you is going to ask about the Biden administration's approach to China. So I'm going to go to you. Don't, don't let me down. Um, have I got a question from somewhere? I'm back now. Can I ask you about the Trump virus? Affiliated. Um, if I could just ask you in relation to the Chinese embargoes on Australian trade, they've actually proved singularly ineffective and not just because of iron ore. The only, only areas that I've looked at where they actually showed significant effect, and some of it were very short term, is in relation to wine, barley, and lobsters. I'm not sure about timber. But for the rest of them, uh, really the effect has been almost zero. In fact, a number of the other commodities are at, at record high prices, world prices in Australia, we're taking full advantage. So that having by and large failed, what do you think China's next move might be? Yeah, it's... Um Quite, quite interesting in a way. I mean, depends on how you define the policy goal is. Um, I think the policy goal is, I think with any kind of a, um, economic statecraft you use, you, you try to change the policy. I think in a way that uh, you probably have all read about the kind of a grievance list handed out by the Chinese embassy. I think this um, across spectrum trade embargo is actually designed Australian government to shape Australian government's decision-making process. I'm, I'm not too sure whether that's kind of designed to change the com commodity price, but in a way to change the Australian government, to force the Australian government to change a certain policy stance. But if that's the goal, that has failed in a way because there's kind of a bipartisan support for the current policy. And also I have to do a bit of a plug-in for the Lowy opinion poll, but you know you can see the opinion poll, you know regarding China has really kind of nosedived. So the kind of a popular opinion also hardened. So in a way that the trade embargo didn't work out, worked in the way intended to. So that can be described as, so that's how I see the whole trade embargo policy. Mm. Uh, in, in wine, it's, yeah. there, there's a, a short term effect in Bali but, uh, the effect in lobster is there, but probably won't last very long. Everything else, copper being the most absurd. But I think if you look at, uh, I mean, the, the sector that's being hit hardest is really across agriculture. 
So that across the board, I think dropped by, you know, don't quote me on a figure, I think around about 25%. So I think the overall the trade probably reduced by about 4%. I think that the gap has really been masked by the iron ore price, which is kind of going through the roof at the moment. I, Roland, yeah, yeah, no, I mean, no, I think I agree at the, the broad level. I mean, there's going to be different impacts in different sectors of the, of the you know, particularly, like you say, wine and lobsters and this sort of thing. At the macro level, which is more where I focus, trade diversion has been a big part of it. It's exactly what you would expect what any economist will tell you, right? Particularly when we're dealing with what you'd call homogenous commodities. In other words, it doesn't really matter where you, where you sell them as long as you sell them. And in none of those markets is, is it the case that China is a dominant buyer uh, on its own, right? Not dominant enough, at least, even say for coal and things like that. So there has been a lot of trade diversion. I think there has been some impact, but the point is it's much smaller than anyone is talking about. So if they've hit maybe about $20 billion worth of our exports in terms of annual value going to China have been affected by these trade sanctions, you might hazard a guess that you're only going to see ended up like three, four billion worth of damage. What is that? A few tenths of a percentage point of our GDP. Um, and in particularly a lot, a lot of that is coal and a lot of the mines are, include foreign ownership. So then when you look at the impact for Australian citizens, even further uh, diluted. So I think the economic impact, I agree with you, is very, very minimal. We know, and you know, as Peter outlined, the political impact as well has been <laughs> quite counterproductive. So I think it's, it's an all round fail <laughs> for China on this front. I'm not sure what demonstration value it has to anyone else watching this. I mean, I think if you're a smaller Asian country, you might feel like you probably don't want to go through it, but you've also seen that it's not actually that bad. So the lessons that others might take away from it are unclear. It's pretty hard to see how this uh, is a win for China in, in my view. But I think the key point is damage less than we thought. Our political institutions also more resilient. And I think it's interesting to think about how we might interpret that for our so quote unquote dependence on China, right? Can we be dependent on China? I don't, I don't like to use the word dependent, interdependent, but can we be interdependent on China and be fine politically because even when they try and squeeze us, it doesn't work? Or should we not be dependent on China because we don't like them doing this? I've, you know, these are interesting questions. Looks like the, the dueling economists, the three of you, actually agree <laughs> on goal. Um, another question. Now we have, it's great to see we have um, basically equal gender representation here. So ladies, we're putting it to you. Send us a question. Consul General. Uh, thank you very much, Alex and gentlemen. A uh, fascinating discussion. I uh, really enjoyed it and lovely to be back in person. Uh, just noting on the trade diversion front, uh, I'm the Irish Consul General and that Australia is in going into the 10th round of negotiations with the European Union on a free trade agreement. Uh, a very stable market uh, and 450 million wealthy consumers ready to buy lots of Australian wine, perhaps even $1.2 billion worth. Um, I was interested in the kind of brief discussion where we touched on uh, the impact of the pandemic on democracy. Uh, a lot of your discussion was about the economic impact. Uh, we've seen some governments use the pandemic to shut parliaments, uh, to uh, say no protesting, for example. And I was just wondering if you had any reflections on the potential impact of the pandemic on democracies and the progression of democracy as well, if that's not a wishful thing. Thank you. Um, yeah, interesting question, um, Consul General. I, I guess what I would say in response to that is that the reaction of the democratic world has been, um, is, has been quite, quite overt and noticeable, hasn't it? So the various, um, the various efforts to put together a D10, I think the British D10, a slightly different makeup from the American D10. We sat in on some closed um, meetings with, with officials from the American D10 countries in the middle of the year. And that um, the effect on democratic freedoms is obviously resonating in democratic, in established democracies very dramatically. Now, um, my colleagues might have something to say about the less established democracies, but the work that we've done on, on democratic um, decon deconsolidation, which was starting already, uh, that's, a, that's a sort of a technical term, I suppose, for the political economists who are, just, who are studying the, the erosion of, of beliefs uh, in 
and commitment to democracy um, around the world and they're looking at the effect of democratic deconsolidation in, in more recent democracies and they're the ones that are, more, that are the more vulnerable. And they're probably also the ones that have been harder hit. That's a generalisation, but many of them have been harder hit by the pandemic, so I expect that to be exacerbated. And there are a lot of initiatives now, um, both at the government level, which I've mentioned, the, the, the D10, Australia's own efforts with the Quad, of course, that's a grouping, that's a democratic grouping, now it's styled as a security grouping, um, but it's already talking about expanding its remit and it already has had finance ministers meetings, it's had foreign ministers meetings, um, and it looks like there's a leaders meeting coming up shortly, uh, the readout from the last Quad meeting, which was only last week, um, it looks like there'll be a leaders meeting very shortly. So that is a democratic grouping as well as a security grouping. And it looks like it's going to expand quite a way out of its original conception, which was security in the Indo-Pacific. Um, so I don't know if anybody else wants to talk about that question. So I think where, where this is really most relevant is in the Southeast Asian um, you know, region. And you know, we have colleagues who focus on that area, and, but unfortunately can't fit the whole brain power of the Lowe Institute on the stage, it would fall apart. But um, it, it's definitely uh, relevant for this for Southeast Asia. It also has some relevance in the Pacific, where uh, you know, using COVID restrictions, they have curtailed some political practice, and you know, like even personal liberties. Like many countries, still have curfews that they've had for months and months and months, and you know, never do not seem to be ending. Uh, and you know, that gives some stability to the country, but is all used been done under the guise of, of COVID. So, um, you know, it's an issue for the Pacific, but I think it's the greatest issue um, mm. in Southeast Asia. But we're definitely seeing slippage of democratic norms across the board in the developing world. Yeah. And our research fellow, Lydia Khalil, actually wrote a really fascinating paper about China's digital authoritarianism. And she wrote it um, and finalised it actually during the first few months of the pandemic. And uh, she's got some great case studies in there about um, China's export of its sort of digital systems to to countries in the Middle East, in Europe, and, and parts of Southeast Asia, Africa, and South America, um, as a sort of an export of its authoritarian control, accelerated, and you know, that's the word of the 2020, wasn't it? Accelerated by the pandemic. Sorry, you wanted to say something? I was, I was just gonna add my, my two cents on that is really that um, what is interesting to me as an economist is, that, is you've had this really steep recession, right? A complete collapse in so many economies, particularly in the developing world, the Pacific, Southeast Asia. And you haven't really seen that great a political sort of backlash or reaction to that, particularly when you're talking about these developing countries where, unlike here, they don't, they don't, they don't have JobKeeper, they don't have job seeker, there's no bailout waiting for them, right? They have to wear this basically and take it, take it on the chin. Um, and you know, from people that you speak to, the more on the political, our colleague on the political science, Jono on the Pacific, um, I think that the consensus is that, you know, for now, there's a bit of a sort of it's not our government's fault. You know, the pandemic is beyond our control sort of effect. But, you know, I think you wait a couple of years and the recovery is not going to go very fast, particularly if these countries don't get help to enable that recovery to go faster. People will forget why they're suddenly living in abject poverty and just remember I'm living in abject poverty and the government can't do anything about it. And so I think it's probably going to get worse in the coming years. Blimey. Sorry. <laughs> Thanks, Rob. Um, any other questions, especially from the ladies? <laughs> Come on. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm going to have to hold, obviously hold up our side. Yes. One more question, I think we have time for. Uh, hello, I'm Tim Ford from uh, a retired soldier and peacekeeper and are now working with the United Nations Association of Australia. I, I'm interested in, in what we're going to predict is going to happen multinationally. Um, we've seen some countries close their borders and a lot of uh, nationalisation go on in the last year. But we've also seen the value of uh, multicultural and people working together. So I'm wondering where you think that's going to go and particularly what Australia might be doing about it. Multiculturalism. Um, well, I mean, I, I'm not sure I have anything particularly informed to say other than, you know, I hope that we will return to, you know, this similar sort of high immigration policies of the past, personally, and, and open acceptance of multiculturalism. I think as people, we talk about it sometimes in the Institute, as people that work on international issues, not being able to visit, not being able to sort of, you know, talk to people in the regions and, you know, cultivate professional relationships and friendships like, like we used to, it does affect your ability to understand the rest of the world and what's going on. I think, you know, that's already palpable. And if that continued, 
and if that was damaged, then I think it would really be you know, a big hit and a, and, a, and a loss. I think for Australia, I think the fact that we have managed the pandemic well and our economy is going to come out of this pretty strong. Right? So I'm a little bit more optimistic on the immigration that's going to return to our country. At least the demand is going to be there. People are going to want to come here. As an economist, we look at things and immigration is very cyclical. When the Australian economy is doing better than other economies, people want to come here. And I think that's going to be the case again. The question is whether or not you know, we're going to be letting them back in. So look, the Lowe Institute was also the host of Scott Morrison's fam infamous speech where he came back from the UN uh, General Assembly railing against negative globalism. So I do, I am skeptical about the, the lengths at which the Morrison government will re-engage wholeheartedly in multilateralism. But then his speech was, was counterbalanced by Maurice Payne, giving one of her most substantive speeches at the ANU last year, where she really doubled down on Australia's commitments to multicultural values and you know, the rules-based order and all of the other, uh, all, all those other ways to describe the, the international system that we, we're a part of. So yeah, it's, it, I mean, they, I, I don't think they've quite got their messaging right on this. I don't think they quite know where they stand on this, but um, I'm fully in, with Roland here that hopefully, you know, it, it is a reminder about yeah, well, um, you know, I think, you know, we're going to have to go back and do some more thinking about that one. You've left us with a dixer on that one, I'm afraid. Well, yeah. it was a very notorious speech. Um, it, it hasn't been revisited, negative globalism, as, as something that, that was sort of an ephemeral idea. And, and to be fair to the government, I think probably its approach to multilateralism, for example, through 2020, um, was, was pretty embracing. Sorry, Peter, did you... Did you want to finish up as the last comment for the um, night? Well, perhaps just kind of one last comment. I think really when it comes to multilateralism, I think now with the Biden administration coming back, reclaiming the American leadership, and one of the things he promised he would do is to, to reinvigorate some of the multilateral mechanism. I think kind of very kind of interesting in terms of a, Last year is a year kind of a dispute between China and Australia. But if you look at some area potentially that can work is actually in terms of the WTO, because for the first time, the government is actually kind of taking China on Bali issue. I think probably one of the best way to resolve some of the dispute is actually through the WTO, the multilateral mechanism. And also kind of is actually strangely enough is also in China's interest because um, China has been so far one of the biggest beneficiary of an open global trading system through WTO. Actually, China has actually not a bad record when it comes to actually adhering to um, WTO adjudication. So actually, if there's any way to resolve um, the kind of a trade dispute, it's not too bad. It's actually a good mechanism, but it can take a very long time. So if you're looking for some kind of immediate relief, perhaps it's not the kind of a preferred platform uh, to have your kind of a dispute resolved, but it is kind of a multilateral um, you know, mechanism is actually good. So I think uh, in terms of a country want to work together, I think WTO is actually about as good a platform as you can get you know, for, for, for kind of free trading country like Australia and also for China, the you know, world's largest exporter of manufactured goods. So it's actually strangely enough in both in China and Australia's common interest to keep WTO ticking over and performing its job. So just on a note of a positive <laughs> <laughs> optimism. Thank you. Um, but I think that puts us right on, on an hour and we like to end promptly um, and on time so you can all go home. Um, I want to thank our panellists, Roland Raja, Jonathan Pryke and Peter Sai. Thank you to the audience for joining us for a discussion about what treats might be in store for us in 2021, but don't hold us to it. Um, there was lots that we didn't talk about tonight, and I had a heap of questions of my own. Uh, we've got COP26 coming up at the end of this year in Glasgow. That's the one that was postponed from last year. We didn't talk much about US foreign policy under Biden, and, and I'm sure you're going to get plenty of that from the Lowe Institute this year. Um, there were many other things we didn't talk about, the big developments with Facebook this week, week which were well, in this last week, which were resolved, I believe, um, today, just a couple of hours ago. Um, we can talk about development throughout the year as well, um, more about development in the Pacific. Um, we actually have some upcoming events. Um, we've got our next Director's Chair podcast, um, which will be released early next week. And I'm delighted to see that our Executive Director, Michael Fullerlove, will be interviewing Frances Adamson, the, the Secretary of the Department of Foreign Affairs, the first female secretary 
Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade and formerly Australia's ambassador to China. So that'll be a fascinating discussion. We've also got an event for International Women's Day, Secret Women's Business at this stage. It'll be screening on the 4th of March and details coming later this week. So we hope we can, you can tune in to that. We look forward to seeing more of all of you throughout 2021 here at 31 Bly Street. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you.